Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, students, whenever you're watching this. This is Mr. McRitchie, and today I'll be explaining the very beginning of Unit 4. Uh, there are already Unit 4 videos in my channel. Uh, however, in the year 2022, in the summer, College Board changed some of the stuff, uh, mostly to reflect how the world actually works now, because over the last 12 years, we've had some very interesting things happen in our economy that I'm going to get to in this unit. So a couple of things have changed, so I've got to re-record the videos. Totally fine, but this means we get new videos. So today's video will be over the very beginning of Unit 4. Now, uh, disclaimer, because I like to do these at the beginning of the units. Uh, unit 4 is hard. Uh, for students in general, is pretty difficult. Mainly because we're talking a lot of vocab that you've never heard of, and relatively high-level vocab, too, like higher-level understandings of lending, banking, borrowing, saving what money is, how interest rates actually work, how they adjust for inflation. Like, there's a lot of high-level concepts, and that's just in the vocab portion. Unifor also has now three graphs in it that are, like, three separate graphs you have to learn. You know, three had one graph that you did a lot with. We're going to do a decent amount with three different graphs in this unit. So buckle up, everybody. This is going to be a, a lot. Today's notes should be a little more on the straightforward side because we're talking about money today. So... Let's get started. So today's notes will be going over money, assets, and interest rates. Now, obviously, I think you know what money is in terms of the like dollar bills you might have on you, but the important understanding for money when we're talking this class is the idea that money is something that you're exchanging for goods and services. Like you in the lunch table back in like elementary school may have swapped different uh, food for different food. Like I have a Slim Jim and my buddy's got a bag of uh, chips and I want to swap those and we swap it, cool. No money was used in that transaction, but money allows us to bypass that sort of trade system. So let's go through some stuff real fast. So first things first, two types of money to be aware of, okay? You have what's called commodity money, which is uh, something that is being exchanged or spent, but has alternate uses. So uh, over the course of human history, a lot of things have served this function. Obviously, things like gold and silver and various uh, valuable metals or minerals, diamonds, things like that, have served as commodity money where they are straight up used to buy things. Not just they're worth a lot, but they are actually used to purchase goods and services because they have alternate uses. In the case of gold and silver and jewelry, it's for aesthetic purposes. Uh, other cases, we've seen things like salt being used as effectively money in, uh, gosh, like pre, in BC times in some cultures across the world. In present day though, uh, kind of dark, but this is an accurate example of it, in the United States prison system, uh, historically cigarettes were used uh, as a money where you would sort of stockpile cigarettes and then utilize them to, uh, let me turn down my volume actually, I think I'm a little bit loud. Let me turn that down a little bit. Okay, that should be better. Uh, cigarettes were used as a means of uh, exchanging for favors, goods and services, someone pick up a job somewhere else. Uh, also presently in the U.S. prison system, ramen noodles are actually used as a form of currency because that's more commonly utilized than cigarettes are uh, in the prison system as cigarettes have fallen out of cultural favor, generally speaking. So yeah, it's, it's something that is money. You use it to buy things and to do stuff, but it has other uses too. What we use and what basically every country in the world uses when it comes to their national currency is something called fiat money. Now that is something that serves money and has no other practical purpose. There is no other way to really use it other than to buy stuff, right? Paper money and coins. The ones, the coins that are not made of like gold and silver, right? Most of our coins are made of very in like not valuable minerals and materials. So using them for anything other than just actually money is kind of uh, eclectic, not normal, not traditional, not something you'd normally see. So the fact that people might say like, you know, it's just a piece of paper, man. Like, yeah, that's actually intentional because the problem with commodity money is if it has other uses, you might use it for that. Like if salt was your money, then if it rained, you got poor because it would dissolve. And also, if you needed to store food, not only did it cost you money, like literally to find storage for it, but it literally cost you money because you had to use your money to like salt the food down so that it would last longer. So it having no other practical purpose is actually intentional and uh, good. It's good for it to be only used for the purposes of money. That way we can track what it's being used for. 
more, more uh, easily. Okay. Now, with money, and again, this is just stuff being used to buy stuff, right? There are three primary functions that money has to have, and if a thing sort of checks these three boxes, it can be used as money in your society. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is there has been a sort of large movement over the last uh, 10 years, really, in our history of cryptocurrency, of these alternative forms of money that people have been trying to sort of get off the ground running, Bitcoin being the most prominent example, but various other ones. And while they can be used circumstantially, because they don't really check these three boxes, it tends to not go well. So, first thing money has to be able to be done to be useful is you have to be able to use it to buy stuff, which... Yeah, like, no duh. But that's the whole point here, is that you use it to buy things. People it, it, people will use it, will take it. It can You can go to a store, I have money, I can buy that thing, easy, here's money. Like, in the case of crypto, not every place accepts Bitcoin. Like, there are some places that do, which is kind of neat. And if you're in, like, really big cities and some of these metropolises in America, you might see some stores that actually do accept it. We li I live in DFW. And the owner of the basketball team here, Mark Cuban, is a big fan of crypto. So you can actually use Bitcoin at the like stadium to buy stuff, which is kind of neat, but not common enough for it, for it to be like a good form of money on the wholesale. It's just good in that context. The no complications of a barter system. Yeah, the whole problem with that like lunch table thing is what if that other kid doesn't like Slim Jims? Then I don't get chips. Everybody wants money though, so you can always use it to buy things. Like the problem with the barter system is that you have what is called a uh, double coincidence of wants, where both sides have to want what the other person is giving up, which, you know, sounds right for a trade. Any of you who play fantasy football are very much aware of, like, the problem with trading as a key mechanic, is that both sides have to want what the other side's giving up, and finding that medium ground is hard. That's why money comes in. Money steps in to avoid that problem. Second thing money should do should be a unit of account, that means it tells me how valuable things are, and that's understandable. Like, I know how much a dollar is generally worth to me, a teacher who lives right on the median income level nationally, right around $60,000 a year. Like, I know how much money is worth to me. I know when a thing is priced in dollars, what the heck that means. And even if it's priced in other currencies, I can just open an app and do a quick conversion and be able to tell. Like, money tells me the value of services. It also tells me, like, societal value, right? Like, on the sports ticket example, while I might not know what Bitcoin is, I generally know, like, how valuable sports tickets are because I like sports, and also I live in America, in America and sports are pretty popular. So, like, seeing a Mavs ticket, which is Mav the Mavs or the basketball team here, uh, would be, like, 150 US dollars. I'm like, wow, that's kind of a lot, but I know how popular sports are, and I know what that really entails. Right? It gives me a good idea of how valuable a thing is. Right? I can tell that certain things are more valuable than others. Certain uh, things have become more or less popular. Right, Supply and demand. Right, That's an easy way to figure this out. And then in the problems of a barter system thing, the, I always use this barter system example where it's like, hey, one goat is worth five chickens. Great. If I have money, this is easy to transact. If I don't have money, what's one chicken worth? A fifth of a goat? What is a fifth of a goat? Like, how are you bisecting, quadris, quintsecting? Is that what it would be? Quint, yeah, quintsecting a goat? Yeah, like, I don't know what a fifth of a thing is. But with money, I know the value of it, and it's easily divisible and stuff like that. So it's easy to figure out value. The last thing, speaking of value, is that money has to store value. This is important and crucial when it comes to especially things that are, less, that are more volatile, like cryptocurrency. It has to maintain purchasing power in the future. Like... One, in a literal way, where I can find a $20 bill that was printed back in the 70s, and it's still $20 today. Granted, inflation messes this up, right? Like, $20 back in the 70s was worth a lot more than $20 is now. You could buy a lot more stuff back in the 70s for $20, but $20 is still $20 and still has purchasing power even today, okay? You want, like, a relatively stable value for it to be a good form of money. It's why the dollar, the U.S. dollar, is the most uh, traded, demanded currency in the world. It's not just because America is like a good economy. It's because it's maintained its value very well over the last hundred years or so. 
It hasn't had the rapid ups and downs of some smaller economies, or even the random changes in them, like with what we're seeing with the pound in the present day, where the pound's value has dropped quite a significant amount over the past, presently this is October 22nd, 2022, over the past like six weeks or so. Uh, the UK has been going through some fun stuff with their economy. So yeah. You want to maintain purchasing power in the future. I know that if I put money in a piggy bank, I can bust that piggy bank open later and buy stuff with it. Will it be as much stuff as it is today? No, but I can still buy stuff with it, right? I don't know if Bitcoin's gonna be even usable in 10 years. Should be, maybe? I couldn't tell you though. I know US dollars are gonna be. Also importantly with the bar system thing, it doesn't die or spoil. If I'm chicken farmer guy and my chickens get sick, I again become incredibly poor super quickly. Uh, my dollar bills can't just die. They can biodegrade eventually if I just leave it in a bad spot for a very long time. But generally speaking, they're pretty dang durable, right? Heck, you can have it go in the washing machine and it sometimes makes it out. So that's what money has to be able to do. Cool. Now, part of the reason why it stores wealth so well is because it is peak liquidity. Now, you might have heard the phrase liquidize your asset, or if you are someone who like watches commercials still, even though it's 2022, you might see like lumber liquidators or these companies that liquidize assets. Liquidity just means to uh, how easily you can convert a thing to spendable form. How easily I can take this thing and make it spendable. Money is peak liquidity, right? Like cash, literal currency is peak liquidity. Some other things are pretty dang close. Like money in my, you know, checking account that I access via my debit card, that's pretty much peak liquidity, right? I use my debit card more than I use cash because it is accepted everywhere, good form of money, and it is effectively one-to-one -one cash, right? I don't have to do any steps to get it into money. If I have stuff in the form of assets, like a stock would be a good example. I have a stock, I can't spend the stock. I can't like go to Starbucks and be like, hey, I've got five shares of GameStop. Can you give me a Frappuccino? I'll give you a share. That's not money, right? I have to sell a stock, get money, and now I have money and can buy myself that espresso whatever I want from Starbucks. So money, peak liquidity. Everything else starts to go down from there. Money is our medium of exchange. So it no conversion, which means number one, liquidity. Most liquid asset is money. That gets us to the money supply. There's a lot of text here. I'll explain as much as you need to understand. The stuff in yellow is what you should write down. Okay, so I'll do a disclaimer here as you're writing. This has nothing to do with text that you have to write down. This is just listen to me say the thing as you are writing. Unit four's probably biggest difficulty area is the amount of vocab that you are unfamiliar with. The sort of lack of familiarity with the concept. Unless you are really big into personal finance or uh, your dad has done a lot of work when it comes to loan stuff or your mom works in finance at, like my mom worked at Fidelity as an insurance company, so I was aware of some things earlier than other kids. Like, you had to have somebody on the inside who really told you a lot for you to know any of this. Like, this is not stuff that comes up in just like regular teenager conversation. So you're, <laughs> it doesn't come up in any other classes either. So there's a lot of unfamiliarity here. Take your time with it, write it down, and then go back in these videos and like listen to me talk it through. Because the text on the screen is what you need to write in your notes but I'm gonna verbalize it in like, what I would call real people words, like common sense understanding, so that you can understand that. Maybe write that down too. But it would, my PowerPoints would get really clustered if I wrote down every word I say. You guys can tell I talk a lot and really fast. So I, I write down the important stuff on the PowerPoints, but go back, listen again, hear how I'm explaining it. It'll help you understand it. Okay, so liquidity is the measure of which how easily things can be converted into cash, liquidized is what that means. The money supply, when we say how much money is in our economy, what we have to understand is that a lot of different things serve as money or are kind of tangentially close. Like I don't want to just think about money in terms of physical currency that exists in our economy because, and we'll get to this later, a lot of the money that you guys have like in your bank accounts, there might not be physical backup of. Like a lot of money in our economy is numbers on a computer screen. So we really need to make sure, like what are we talking about when we say money supply? So how we do that is we have these different categories, like these different breakdowns of the money supply. I think of them as like tiers, but each of the tiers include the ones that are below it. So M0 is your 
Uh, this is money we know exists tier. This is money that the government can vouch for, that can guarantee exists. It's called the monetary base. It is money held by the central bank. It is physical currency that exists, so we know it exists because we printed it. And it's money that banks are storing at the centralized bank. We'll talk about the central bank more later in this course, but understand the central bank for us is effectively our bank's bank. It is the uh, government entity. I say government, but it's not technically part of the government. The government-like entity that oversees the banking system, that acts, yes, as a large bank for the banks, but also makes the rules that banks have to follow. So M0, currency, so paper money that we know exists, right? You know what that is. Currency is just dollars and cents, things that you have some of that in your wallet maybe. And banking reserves, so money that the banks are storing at the central bank. So the, the central bank can confirm that money all exists because it's there. They know it's there. Right. And the paper money that exists, they printed. So they know that exists too. Right. That's M0. That's like, we know this is here. We can guarantee you it physically exists. There is backup of it. M1 is what we are probably most commonly saying when we refer to the money supply. Uh, when we say how much money is in our economy, we are most likely referring to M1. In this class, when I say the term is money supply, I mean M1 which is going to include that monetary base. So the currency and circulation thing, those bank reserves, those count here. That is money. And all of these M's include the previous category. So M0 will in, or M1 will include M0, M2 will include M1 and M0. They all include the previous tiers, okay? So M1 includes currency, yep. Demand deposits, which is money in your checking account. It's money that can be instantly taken out of your bank, right? If it's in my checking account, I can go onto my phone right now, Venmo, Cash App, whatever. I can use that, spend that. I can use PayPal. I can use my bank account money, my checking account money instantaneously. That's demand deposit. Other liquid deposits like savings accounts. Savings accounts count here too because I can just as easily move money from my savings account to my checking account. It is not that hard. This is technically a change to be clear. Savings accounts used to be listed in M2, but over the last couple of years, that's been reorganized because all my banking has become so commonly used that savings accounts are effectively as liquid as checking accounts are. And checkable deposits, which, which are a uh, small savings tool that if you go into personal finance, you'll hear about very early. It's one of the more basic ways to save your money outside of a savings account. Uh, you don't have to know what it is here. Just know that a checkable deposit will function largely like a demand deposit. If you see checkable deposits, you can, for the sake of this course, treat it as if it's just money in your bank, even though it's technically a more specific savings tool. But it still can be almost instantly converted into cash, so we count it as M1. So when I say the money supply in this class, when, I'm, when we get to a graph that has supply of money on it, that's M1. M2 and M3, I'll mention here, AP exam, I don't think is gonna really be asking about these anymore just because so much of what we would call common sense tools are in M0 and M1. But M2 includes some retirement money, some money what are, in, are called money market funds, which is a more complicated savings tool than the checkable deposits. Uh, small denomination time deposits, which are, is basically a way of like, hey, bank, hold onto this money for me. They'll give you extra interest, but you can't touch it for a, for a set amount of time. So it says less than 100,000 because like 50K, hey bank, hold onto this for me. Don't let me touch it for a year. It's less liquid because I can't touch it for a year. I can't spend it for a year. So it's smaller denominations so that it's, it's usually easier to get the money out. You, like there are ways to get it out. It just costs a little bit. They to charge you a fee. The small time denomination deposits, it's not as hard to pay that fee. So that's fine, uh, but think M2 is a little more complicated. Individual savings and retirement accounts, because again, like an IRA or, or a retirement fund is a little harder to get your money out of. Uh, money market fund, which shouldn't show up on the AP exam in terms of like that term, I don't think show up. And like your small time deposits, that too, which is again, like basically the bank just holds on the money for a specific window of time where you can't touch it. M3 again includes M0, M1, M2. And larger time deposits, like more than 100K, what you find out is the more money you have, the harder it is to access all of it. Like imagine you have, you know, this would be amazing, $20 million in your bank account. You should never have that much money in your bank account. If you had that much money, you should have other assets. But if you did, 
You can't just, like, go to your local Wells Fargo ATM and be like, cool, withdraw $20 million. <laughs> the, the ATM doesn't have that kind of money, right? Heck, even the bank itself, like the branch that you go to, probably doesn't have that much money in it physically. So you can't withdraw it, which means it's not as easy to convert that bank account into cash, right? So your larger deposits, the more money you have, the less liquid it is for the simple fact that it becomes harder to access at very large amounts. Like less than 100K, you shouldn't have a hard time. But past that point, it gets a little bit funky. So just to, just to clarify what I mean by like the includes previous ones, this is a good visual for it. We're like M0 is your base, M1 includes M0 and other stuff, M2 includes M0 and M1, and M3 includes all of the things above it. So these are just different ways of categorizing what we would call money, right? Like money in your retirement account, I might think of as part of my money. It's not like literally dollars in my checking account, but it's money that I have and at least kind of have access to. It's harder to access it, which is why it's M2 and not M1, but I still have access to it. If you have other financial assets, like a stock, that, that could be down the line. There's more categories than just M3. It goes to like M4 and stuff like that. Those are even less liquid because you might have to like sell a thing. Like a car is a... Uh, pretty low level of liquidity. Because if I want to spend my car, I have to go sell my car and get money. And that kind of takes some time to get like good value on it, right? So as I move up the numbers, like up numerically, zero, one, two, three, things become a little less liquid, a little harder to spend them, the value that's there. And again, all the M's include the ones that are more liquid. So M3 includes the ones below it on and on down the line. Just so you have an understanding of what I mean by this, here's like a, I think I took this from a multiple choice question on an AP exam, where they are saying, hey, you've got this form of money, M0 and M1. We've got currency in circulation, cash in bank vaults, bank reserves, and demand deposits. What is the value of the monetary base here? That would just be the $27 that we can guarantee exists. The cash in bank vaults is not held by the Fed. That's just reported by the bank. So the Fed doesn't like guarantee that exists. They know $20 physically currently exists in circulation. And there's $7 the banks have stored at the Fed's. The Fed's like, I can vouch for $27 of this. Everything else actually have, I could not tell you if it physically exists. But there's at least $20 that I can tell is printed and $7 in reserves. What is the value of the M1 money supply here? Well, that includes currency and demand deposits. So that would be your 820, right? There's your M1. Okay, assets. Now I mentioned with all that uh, M0, M1, M2 stuff when it comes to money supply and your how much money is there in the economy. The most common question I get at this point is, wait, how is there more money than like physically paper exists? We'll get to that. It's a thing called the money multiplier. It'll show up in what is the next video when we go over the banking system. Let's just say that banks have a cool way of making more money exist than actually exists in the economy. It will freak you out. <laughs> Disclaimer, it's scary to hear about because you're like, oh, it's just paper money that exists. It's like, dog, do you really think when you get like direct deposit from your, from your job that like your job mails money to the bank? No, and it's just numbers on a computer screen, guys. You know if that exists? Tricky. Okay, sorry, tangent. Assets. So. Money versus wealth, common mistake. You see like net worth of a celebrity and you're like, wow, they have that much money in their bank? No, they do not. Like when you see like Elon Musk's net worth is like 200 billion or whatever the heck they say. Uh, no, it, that's because he owns the majority of stock of Tesla. So all of that stock value gets added in. All of the homes he owns gets added in. All of the planes and cars he owns gets added in because wealth is the accumulation of all of your savings and assets and money that you've got. It is not just the money, it is everything that's tied to your name. It is your savings accounts, it is any physical thing you own would be a part of your wealth, like the monetary value of stuff you own. So some of you guys might have like very little money, but actually a decent amount of wealth, because say your parents bought you a car, but it's in your name. The title is in your name now. Great, then that car is part of your wealth. If you own a bunch of clothes and a bunch of like decent shoes and like a gaming console or a good computer, and these were all given to you and are now effectively your things, 
that's a decent amount of wealth you might actually have. Like, you might have, like, some students might have, like, 50K of wealth. Not have 50K in the bank, good God, no. They might have, like, $25 in the bank and can't buy themselves, like, Chick-fil-A. But they have some wealth. You've got some stuff. Some things that are in your name you actually count as part of your wealth. So it's all of that stuff. Here's a weird thing, though. When it comes to money and wealth, uh, unit one, one of the earliest concepts, opportunity cost. People don't think about this, but there is an inherent opportunity cost to money, to just having money, like having physical cash or money in my checking account versus my savings account. And that is interest. Like, say I've got $1,000, right? If I keep it all in cash, then I have $1,000. If I put it all in savings, like a savings account, I get $1,000 plus interest, right? So by having it as money, as spendable currency, I have a little bit of a cost to that, which is any interest or profit I could generate if it was in the form of an asset, like a bond, or if I was lending it, or if I was saving it. So when you, the opportunity cost of holding money is interest. I have it in bold, I have it highlighted because it's a classic AP exam question because it's like a, ooh, big brain. But yeah, like, the problem with me having cash in my wallet at all is that it's not in my savings account earning me interest, right? Now, for most of you guys, and for me too, to be honest, your savings account isn't going to offer you that much interest because you don't have that much money in it. The more money you have in it, the more they offer an interest to incentivize you keeping it there. We'll get into why that is later. So your most basic assets that you have to know for the AP exam, because these will show up you don't have to understand them fully, but you have to know what's going on when you read it in a question. So, a loan. Easy. I think you get this. There's a lender, there's a borrower. A person takes out a loan, has to pay it back over time, plus interest. I gotta go to college, I gotta borrow 30k over the course of four years to pay for my university, so I take my money out from either a bank or the government, the government does student loans too, and I've gotta pay that money back, plus interest over a designated period of time, for student loans, that's 20 years, most commonly. So there's a loan. Yeah, you're aware of that one, I think. Bank deposit, like a savings account or even a checking account, technically, is an asset because it's not money that I actually have. So it's not technically money in that I don't have it as M0, right? But it's money I can access. So my savings or checking account, most commonly, I would say a savings account is more of an asset, but you'll probably see just deposits in general listed as an asset because it's safer, right? Like the pitch of putting your money in a bank account is that even if a bank gets robbed, the bank account is insured. Like if I just have money in my wallet and it just gets stolen, I can't just like be like, hey, can I have that money back government? And the government's like, yeah, but it's okay. Uh, no, but if it's in a bank and the bank gets robbed, I can get it back because there's insurance on that, which is very cool. We love that. Oh, uh, that's also just to get to say, if a bank robbery is happening, do just do nothing. Just be very chill. Like, again, call the cops and everything, but, like, don't risk your life because you're not actually getting robbed in a bank robbery. Your money isn't being taken. Uh, it, it's insured. And if you're even a victim in the bank robbery, like, you're there when it happens, that is oftentimes also insured by the government, which is super cool. Okay, stocks. A share of ownership in a company. This is the idea of a stock. I buy a GameStop stock like that was all the rage two years ago. Or I buy a stock in Amazon or Apple or Google or, which technically is Alphabet is the name of the Google one. Uh, but you buy a stock which is a part of a company. It's a very, in a lot of these companies' cases, an incredibly small slice of pizza. Like, you've seen the pizza, like, back in kindergarten, where they would slice it to, like, 30 seconds of a pizza slice. We're talking, like, millionths of a slice of the pie of ownership of a company. So when you're buying stock in a company, you're actually buying a share of ownership. If you have enough shares, you can go to, like, shareholder meetings where you are actually included in business decisions. You would have to own quite a crazy amount of stock and be very heavily invested into the business for that to happen. But that can still happen. So it's share of ownership of a company. And the, the goal of a stock is you buy it and you hope the company becomes worth more so that you can then sell that stock later for a profit. So effectively you're, in, in fun words, gambling on how well the business is gonna do. The last one is a bond. And this is the one that I always have to explain quite in depth. So I have an entire other slide for bonds. 
A bond is an IOU to repay principal and interest. When I say IOU here, I mean literally someone owes somebody else money. Like I owe you money. I O W E Y O U money. So you repay a principal amount plus interest. It is very similar to a loan functionally. The difference is that you, like individual human person you, might actually be the lender in an official capacity with a bond. So let me kind of explain this. I wonder if the next slide has the full description. Okay, it does. Lots of text here. I'm gonna explain it. I'll say the highlighted stuff first. Bonds are a debt obligation, a thing a person has to pay back. So it's a type of borrowing, okay? Uh, a person buys a bond, someone else is selling the bond, and the person who buys the bond is then going to get paid back money over time by the seller. So the buyer is the lender, the seller is the borrower. Let's explain this in full. Lots of text here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do real people speak for a while. I'm actually gonna go just full screen on my face. Okay, bonds, okay. This is always a tricky bit because kids just haven't heard this. So in your A push or your, in my kid's case, on ramps, world his, US history classes, uh, when we had World War II stuff going on, I bet you saw a lot of propaganda posters that said things like buy war bonds, right? A war bond. And I don't know if your teachers actually explained what a bond was. Some kid might have asked and they might not have been able to explain it. Uh, the idea is the government is saying, hey, buy this lovely little certificate. It, like It's literally like a piece of paper, like a certificate, a piece of paper. And when you buy this from us, it'll have a number on it in terms of dollar value, like say $1,000, right? So that means that that bond will cost you thousand dollars you give the government a thousand dollars they give you this certificate that says bond one thousand dollars on it from u.s government it'll also have an interest rate on it this is called the coupon rate and it'll have a term date basically and here's the idea you have the certificate the certificate is a debt obligation meaning the government owes you this is the cool part the government owes you a thousand dollars due at the end of that term. So 10 years eventually could be, the, it's like the longest typically for a normal bond, would be like 10 years. So they owe you $1,000 at 10 years. However, they also have to pay interest on that every year or twice a year in some cases. So say that interest rate is 5%, which is not a crazy interest rate, right? That's, that's kind of normal. So you've got a $1,000 bond, there's a 5% interest rate. That means every year the government has to pay you 50 bucks for 10 years. And then at the end of 10 years, they pay you a thousand. So you get 50 bucks a year for 10 years plus a thousand back, meaning you paid a thousand dollars for the certificate, and at the end of 10 years, you're going to receive $1,500. Oh. So let's be clear here. When you buy the bond, like you're the one who gave the government the thousand dollars, and they gave you that certificate, that bond, the certificate you are lending to the government. The government is borrowing from you. The war bond thing was, and this is the fun part, effectively crowdfunding. Like a war bond is a government crowdfunding a war. With the like, hey people, we don't want to necessarily tax you more because you'll hate that. How's about you lend us some money right now and we'll pay you back in X amount of time. And you can see bonds that are six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years. And there's some crazy ones that are like 20 years that are meant for like you to buy for your kid and stuff like that. So you buy this bond, you're gonna get paid back that interest and stuff over time, right? That's very cool. It's, it's a way for you to be the lender and for you to capitalize off of the interest game. Because for most cases, outside of your savings accounts, interest is kind of scary for most of us because it's like, crap, I got to pay back a lot for my student loans because of the interest. Dang it, my mortgage has an interest, so like paying for my house is kind of a lot. Like, these things are all very scary because of interest. If I buy a bond, I'm the one who benefits from the interest. I'm the lender. The government owes me money, which is kind of incredible. The government isn't the only one who issues bonds, though. Like, businesses can do it, too, as a means of just getting a quick influx of cash. Uh, you'll see local governments do this all the time. School districts do this all the time to finance things that they need money for right now, but don't have. So as opposed to taking out a loan from a bank, they take out a loan from like the community where people pay into it. It's cool because when they pay that money back, it goes back into the community, which is very useful. It goes back to people's pockets, which is again, very cool. And the other part that's cool with a bond, and now I gotta go back to the PowerPoint is that you as the person who owns that certificate 
can then sell that certificate to somebody else. Like, you gave the government money. They gave you this bond worth $1,000 plus some interest, right? Cool. That interest rate on the bond is fixed. This is like 5% this whole time. Done. Okay. Cool. You can resell that to somebody else. So say you buy that bond because you're like 10 years from now. I'm good on money. I don't need $1,000 right now. But then in a year or two, you things break bad for you. You aren't making as much money. And you can't really wait 10 years for this one grand. You can flip it. You can, hey, hey, Jimmy, uh, this bond's going to cash out and give you $1,500 in 10 years. How about you give me... Uh, 1100 for it right now. Jimmy's like, all right. So maybe you may, you might still make profit off of reselling it. However, an additional way for you to make profit has to do with interest rates. So I have to explain. So this is, again, that's one of those things that I have to explain really, really well because this is kind of complicated. So the relationship that you want to write down is that the price of previously issued bonds has an inverse relationship with interest rates, right? Previously issued bonds interest rates, inverse relationship. Okay, here's what I mean. It's not the like $1,000 price that's listed on the bond. This is the resale price, this is the resale value. When you want to sell your bond when you've already got one and you're like, I wanna flip this to make some money. Here's the idea. You buy a $1,000 bond with 5% interest, okay? Say the interest rates start to go down nationally on average. So the government, it continues to issue bonds, but the new bonds they're issuing only have like a 3% interest rate on it. Whose bond is better to have? The one that you have or one of the newer ones? Yours will be better because as opposed to getting $50 every year, people who buy those new bonds would only be getting $30 a year. So they'd rather have yours, which means you could sell your bond for more because interest rates have gone down. The price, the value of your previously issued bond is going up as interest rates go down because yours is carrying a higher rate of return. Remember, you're the lender when it comes to bonds. Lenders like high interest. They get paid more if it's a high interest rate. So as interest rates start to fall, your bond becomes worth more. Ah, that's great. So you can make profit off that. And if interest rates go the other way, this is the downside. If interest rates start to climb quite a bit nationally, which is what's been happening over the past year or so in America, that means your previously issued bond is not going to be worth as much. Like I could either buy a $1,000 new bond at 6% interest rate or your bond at 5%. You're not going to be able to charge me $1,000. Because if I have $1,000, I'm going to buy the 6% bond. It's a better deal. So you'll have to charge me less. Maybe you have to do some math to figure out what's a fair price to ask there. Maybe it's a $900, maybe it's $850. Either way, you're probably taking a loss as someone who's reselling that bond. So you probably don't resell it. It's not a great time for you to resell. So the price or value of previous issue bonds has an inverse relationship with interest rates. Okay, that's the big thing. Now, last bit. This is the end of the lesson. I know there's a lot of, of words here. So nominal versus real interest rates. So. When you take out a loan or put your money in savings or buy a bond, the interest rate you see is the nominal interest rate. That is just the interest rate on that asset, okay? So like you look at your savings account and it's gonna tell you the nominal. You look at a bond when you buy it, it tells you the nominal. You look at your loans and it tells you the nominal. That's just the rate and interest rates are your rate of return on an investment. So that could be a loan is an investment for the lender, the bank, Savings account is an investment for you. You're saving your money for the future. And a bond is an investment for the buyer because they're hopefully going to make money in the long term because, again, the buyer is the lender. So those are the rates. That's the how much money you have to pay back. Important to know, you're just it's just telling you the number that you're paying back. It is not telling you the value of said number because, as we've talked about already in this class, the value of money changes over time. Which, importantly, and I think this was covered back in Unit 2, we mentioned that when there's unexpected inflation, borrowers benefit and lenders lose because you get paid back more or less in value than what you thought. Here's how. So, this is called the Fisher Equation. It's one of the few math things that you have in this unit. And you've technically seen it before. Back in Unit uh two we did hit this sort of it was it was in the review for the test for us and then depending on how your teacher teaches this they might have covered this too here but the real interest rate is the 
value rate of return on a financial asset. So while I might be paying back $10,000 over the course of 10 years, $10,000 10 years from now might only buy as much stuff as $8,000 does now because money is becoming less valuable. So you would need more of it to do the same stuff, which sucks. For the lender, it sucks, right? So to figure out the real interest rate of a loan or of a bond or whatever, you just take the nominal interest rate and you subtract the inflation rate out of it. Or you can go this way where your nominal rate equals your real rate plus your inflation rate. Technically this first one is the Fisher equation, but I almost always think of it like this because you're not, not really ever given the real rates, you're given the nominal and then you can figure out inflation and then subtract them. So say I'm being charged 9% interest on my uh, loan for a car, which is a lot to be clear, it's quite a bit. If there's 5% inflation, then really I'm only paying 4% interest in terms of value. I'm paying back 9% of the number, but again, that number is worth less in the future. The number buys me less stuff in the future. So paying 10K 10 years from now hurts me less than paying 10K does right now. So there's the idea with real versus nominal interest is that real interest is telling you the actual value. How hard are you really being hit? Nominal is telling me the number that I'm being hit by, just literally the raw number. The You are paying back this percentage. However, it might not feel as bad as that because of inflation. This is like the, one of the saving graces of, say, inflation happening in the economy right now, is that because inflation is happening at this rate, and a lot of the us are dealing with what are with what could be fixed interest rate loans, then as inflation kicks in, we start paying back less in value than what we borrowed because everything else is so expensive right now. My loan is not getting more expensive, which means it's getting comparatively cheaper, if that makes sense. Like it's not getting really that much cheaper, but functionally it is becoming less of a portion of my spending because everything else is getting more expensive. So that's, this is again the borrowers benefit, lenders lose from inflation thing. Also hurts you if you're buying a bond, right? If I buy a bond with 5% interest on it, but there's 4% inflation, I might only really be getting 1% return on that. Because again, in 10 years, that $1,500 I'm getting paid back might not be worth as much, and it won't be worth as much as $1,500 is worth right now. So here's the last thing, which is just some math you could see. Uh, in the country of McRitchie land, banks charge 5% interest on loans. What is the real interest rate if we expect 2% inflation? Well. My nominal rate equals my real rate plus inflation rate. My nominal is five, my inflation is two, so my real would be three. So even though people are getting, are paying back 5% interest on loan, it's really only gonna hit them like 3%. Like they'll be paying five, but in terms of their spending power, it's really only a 3% knock. And in a different year, assume that the expected inflation rate is three years and they're experiencing a real rate of return of negative 2%. That means you're actually gaining money like you're actually kind of winning as the borrower not just like saving but actually gaining value so again i would use the same formula negative two is my real rate so my nominal interest rate had to have been one this is the problem with having super low interest rates it's also why savings accounts can suck uh, a low interest rate can really kill you when it comes to inflation if you're the lender or the saver if you're the lender then they're actually paying back the person more in value than what they had negotiated it's, they kind of lose full on. They're getting paid back more number, but because of spending power wise, they're straight up losing the transaction. This is why banks charge a decent amount of interest on loans is because they have to factor in that inflation is going to be happening. And because of that, it could really knock them off their socks. Okay, so that is it for this first lesson. There's a lot of stuff in here. And this is probably like the most sort of basic, but like starting point level of stuff for the unit. Again, that's why the unit is kind of hard because that's this that's the starting point like the bond thing it's kind of hard feel free to look up videos explaining how bonds work in the powerpoint i have one that's oh, from td ameritrade which is like investing basics with bonds not a bad idea just to, that's the only one there that i think is like a real what's happening kind of question in terms of not sure loans i'm pretty sure you understand savings account or just bank deposits i think you understand a stock honestly in terms of just i can buy a part of a company and i want to sell when the company's worth more you don't have to know like how the stock market works for ap macro 
you just gotta know what a stock basically is. A money-making tool, right? And it's the only one of those that doesn't like involve interest rates at all. Make sure you know what the different categories of the money supply are. Most importantly, M0 and M1. Again, M0 is money we know physically exists. That is money that's in the central bank and currency that is out there in the world. M1 includes M0 plus deposits, savings account, checking account, checkable deposits, all of those things. You got to know those. Know what money is, what its functions are, can be used to buy things, can be used to measure value of things and hold its value over time. Those are the three big functions it has to hit. And then know that there's commodity and fiat money that are your two different types. It's a lot of stuff there. I know it's a lot of text. I know it's a longer video. It's a long video, 45 minutes. It's a full lecture, no breaks, all gas. Okay, just ton, ton of stuff. But that is your sort of like foundation level vocab that you've got to understand. Okay, uh, the next video in the series, I'm not going to update because I don't actually need to. This is the banking system and balance sheet stuff. Uh, that largely hasn't changed. That math is still the same. That content is still the same in our course. So that video will have me with a different hair color and be from two years ago, but that one still works. So thank you all for watching. Uh, please, again, feel free to leave a comment if you have a question about what happened here. Uh, if you feel like liking or subscribing, go for it. I never care if you really do, but it's nice if you want to. Uh, I don't. This isn't a monetized channel. Um, but yeah, thank you. Oh, so there's the dog in the back. You can see him. Good little guy. He's Archer. He's just hanging out, sleeping. Cool. But thank you guys for watching. Really do appreciate it. Have a great one.